All right, everybody out there forgot there missed a whole lot, all the really good stuff. Um, <laughs> recall requests are for things that people want more urgently, and they tell the system make it due back sooner than the original person um, had been told that it would be due back. Pager requests are for things that are uh, currently on the shelf, and for whatever reason, the patron is not going to go to the shelf themselves to retrieve it either because uh, you know, it's closed stacks and the patron isn't actually allowed to walk into the stacks to get it themselves, or um, the, your library just may have that service. I know my local public library does. I never ever go into the library and pick things off the shelf myself. I always just place a request and then they tell me when it's ready to come get. Uh, don't know how well you can see this, but this is um, the edit request screen that shows you all the different things that we're currently working on for kind of all types of requests. We have um, you know, information about the type of request that it is, its current status, the expiration date, which you know, when you're editing the request, you can change that. So if the person says, all right, I'd actually like to wait another year to try to get this thing, you can extend it. And the whole shelf expiration date is only for things that are awaiting pickup. It won't even appear if your book is not, complete, or is not currently awaiting pickup. And it's something that you can edit and extend in case the patron wants to uh, come in later than they had originally wanted to. Various information about the library. Um, fulfillment options are down here in the bottom in the requester section. And that just basically says what, whether the person's gonna come pick it up or whether you're gonna deliver it to them and the location of each of those things that they wanna do. So where they wanna come pick it up and where you need to deliver it to. All the way down at the bottom, um, you have uh, proxy information. So this is basically the you know, a faculty member, the most common case for this is a faculty member sponsors a grad student who will then go to the library and do all of their uh, legwork for them. Um, and so you can borrow as a proxy and you can also request as a proxy. Oh, I already talked about fulfillment options. Um, <laughs> so this is just basically what it's gonna look like. <laughs> the, uh, you know, if you're choosing delivery, uh, there will be one or more addresses that you choose from to deliver to. If it's a hold shelf, you'll have more than one or more um, service points that this person can come get the item. The request queue. At the moment, it's first in, first out. The oldest request is at position number one. We're going to be working on the bulk actions and the, the ability to reorder the queue. These are a lot of times that you know, a request that's at number four in the queue really needs to be bumped up to the top because it is, for whatever reason, a little more urgent or more important than the ones farther down. Like the dean wants something. Um, <laughs> so, uh, at the, in this case, in this mock-up, um, you'll see that the one at the top is a is a an awaiting pickup request, which kind of makes sense because <clears throat> if it's halfway in process, it's kind of at the top of the queue. Anyway, so later we'll have bulk actions in terms of like you can cancel multiple requests at a time, you can update multiple requests at a time. But for uh, right now, we have the request queue as first in, first out. Uh, coming soon, um, remote storage requests. We're working on that. Um, we're working with a couple of other, we have to work with a couple of other SIGs on this. And this is, you know, your remote storage facilities. And one of the things it needs to do is interoperate with the, you know, the robots that retrieve the books. So we're, the future is robots and we're gonna have requests talk to them. Um, request policies, request cancellation, slips and notices. Um, obviously, sometimes you wanna be able to cancel a request. And so you have to work out exactly what all the steps are that Folio needs to go through to clean up the item, clean up the request perhaps clean up the patron's record, slips and notices. Um, Darcy will be talking about those later, but there are a lot of things that need to pop out of your computer for um, requests and for request related slips. You know, if you, something comes in and you wanna put it on the hold shelf, you'll need something to tuck into the book to put it on the hold shelf to tell you who it's for, um, when they need to pick it up by, various things like that. Request policies are, all of the rules that we want you to be able to put into place, the logic of, that says who can place a request, what they can request, what type of request they can, they can have, because not all of your patrons may be allowed to have something delivered to them. Um, and then, you know, basically things like where they're allowed to pick it up, where they might be allowed to have it delivered to, 
and what fulfillment options are available to them. That's the pickup and delivery. Yes, that's pickup and delivery. Um, oh, and then I'm done. Wow. I always talk very fast during these things. Who's next? Me. Gave you three extra minutes. <laughs> This isn't a great setup for someone who has vertigo, but I'll see, I'll see how it goes. Yeah, can you time me? I'm sure I'm gonna need it. Okay, I don't use Mac, so. Hopefully that won't matter. You'll okay. Two-minute warning. Two-minute warning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Holly Misselbauer, and I'm a product owner for Folio Fees and Fines. Uh, when I first started working on Fees and Fines, I thought, oh, that's going to take a few weeks, and then I'll move on to something more interesting. Uh, wrong. First of all, in both, both points, uh, first of all, it's a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. And second of all, uh, it's been months. Uh, so uh, fees and fines are much more involved than I thought, uh, just because I return my books on time and undamaged <laughs> doesn't mean that other people do the same. Uh, so this is an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, there are a lot uh, more things involved with fees and fines that I'm not going to get to, but I thought I would talk about the basics. Uh, you have to charge fees and fines, of course, uh, you need to be able to view the fees and fines that someone owes. And then you have to be able to, of course, pay, uh, waive, refund, transfer, all of those things uh, for fees and fines. And then, assuming I have time, talk about lost, lost items because that is um, a big part of uh, where fees and fines come into to play. So let's talk about charging fees and fines. By the way, I love this, uh, this new... Um, template for, for PowerPoint. Whoever did it did a great job. So we really have two types of fees and fines. Uh, one is uh, the manual fees and fines in, in Folio, and the other are automated fees and fines. So manual fees and fines are defined by an institution. So they can be anything you want them to be. You can charge a fee or a fine for anything you want. And it's defined uh, either at the institution level or at the unit level. Um, there are actually libraries who have bus passes that they sell, so that would be a kind of fee. Uh, you give me $10, I'll give you a bus pass. Uh, they sell uh, equipment, you know, small pieces of equipment, an SD card, a, a, a USB drive. Uh, and then they also rent lockers, carrels, whatever. Uh, they charge for different kinds of printing. Uh, so those are the kinds of uh, fees, and, fees and fines that are charged manually because somebody comes to the desk and says, I want to plot this poster, I want to buy a USB drive. And then you have the fees and fines that most of us uh, more commonly associate with the library, which are for overdue items and then items that are lost or aged to lost, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, I'm focusing on items that are age to lost, whereas uh, Emma, who's responsible for, uh, Emma Betcha, who's responsible for uh, loans, is focusing on the ones that are reported as lost. So uh, I'm not doing a live demo. Uh, the development team that I'm working with on uh, fees and fines is a university uh, called UNAM. They are located in Mexico City. And um, I can access uh, their server from my desktop at, at work uh, using my, you know, my IP address from work, uh, but not from here. And um, they're in the process of uh, 
uploading their code to the, the code changes into GitHub, but they ran into some issues. So hopefully their code will be in GitHub soon. Um, so I'm showing some screen prints and then just some designs. Uh, so charging manual fees is ready. And uh, so the uh, fee fine owner uh, is populated with whoever is, uh, wherever you're located, whatever desk you're at. Uh, and then this is, the, this is the library that's going to get the money. Uh, and then you put in the fee fine type, which comes from a table and then the amount. Uh, there are default amounts in the table, but of course with something like a damaged book, uh, you're not going to, it's going to be based on how much damage has actually been done. Um, so you can, you know, actually update that. Uh, and then item information, sometimes an item is involved, sometimes an item is not. So if you're selling uh, a bus pass, obviously uh, there's no item uh, involved with that. And you can actually get to the charge manual fee page uh, from multiple sources, uh, from user details, which I think is now being called user information, from loan history and from fee fine history. And let me just quickly show that. So this is the uh, user information, uh, which I'm still calling user details, but I need to change my, my way of thinking. Uh, so there's a fee fine section and there's a charge fee fine button there. So if you're looking at user information, you know, this is probably the go-to place when you're talking about users. And then you can go and charge if you find there. And then uh, within the loan history, there's a new fee fine option. And then within uh, fee fine history, there's a couple different ways that you can charge a new uh, fee fine. Uh, so regardless of where you uh, start from, you're going to go to this uh, page that I just showed you where you can actually charge uh, a fee fine. And then automated fee fines, uh, it's really a bunch of code. It's not really anything to, to look at uh, because it's happening uh, in the background. Um, so, oh, I went too far. Let me go back here. So the, the fees and fines are owned by the library that has the item on their shelf, uh, not where you pick the book, the item up. So you may have requested that the item be delivered to a different library, but it's really the, the, the owning library that collects the fees and fines. Um, now, if the, if the item was temporarily shelved, like in a reserve shelf of a, lot, of a certain library, then they're going to own, um, own that item as far as fees and fines are concerned. Um, and then there'll be a loan policy. There's a fee fine policy that will be associated with the loan policy for that. For that item that will set the rules. Um, we have grace periods. Some libraries don't use grace periods. That's fine. Um, that will be set in the loan policy. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of other settings um, associated with that. We're also going to be calculating pending fees and fines. This is a little pr lower priority than uh, other work, um, but we're going to be keeping track of uh, fees and fines that the patron's going to owe if they don't uh, return the book within the uh, within the grace period so that they understand um, what they could be charged. So viewing fees and fines, you can actually see the fees and fines that are owed all over the place. Now, of course, Folio is a staff, uh, a staff product, uh, but the fees and fines will be available uh, to be displayed in your patron um, UI. So uh, as I already showed you, you'll be able to see the fees and fines within uh, user details. Um, so you'll be able to see what's accruing, which is what we're calling pending. You'll be able to see uh, what's owed uh, and also uh, something that I'm not gonna talk about today except for right this minute. You'll be able to see what's claimed returned. So these are items that we, were, we charged a patron uh, we were charging a patron overdues on, and then they said, whoa, wait a minute, um, you, uh, I actually returned those. And so we're trying to find out if they were, if they are actually on the shelf, um, because that does actually happen with regularity. Uh, the fee fine history uh, lists all of the fee fines for the patron. Um, this is a great, UNAM's working, uh, actively working on this, and there's a lot going on on this page. So um, you can open, you can look at just open, closed, or all fee fines. 
Um, they're in chronological order right now, but as with all things folio, all tables folio, you can um, sort in whatever order you want. You can sort, uh, in this case, the item column, column is sorted. Um, and uh, I don't have an example of this, uh, but if you click, pardon? Okay, if you click on this uh, icon here, you can see, uh, you'll get a box that you can search, you get a panel, excuse me. You can search, you can filter, uh, because as I've learned, there are some patrons who have pages and pages of fines. Uh, and it's a lot more common than you think. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. And so uh, you do need to be able to do some filtering to really uh, check things out. And then if you click, I should go back. If you click on one of these lines that represents, one of these rows that represents one fee and fine, then you get to the details of the fee and fine, and you can see all the activity that's happened. Um, so this is showing uh, a patron who, who, dam who uh, damaged a camera that had to be replaced. This is showing all the activity that's happened as the patron has, we waived part of it, they paid part of it, they paid more. Uh, this is loan history uh, where you can, this is a little too, okay. So loan history, you can see the fee fines and you can go to the details of the fee fine as well. Loan details, you can see the fee fine and actually click on it to see the details. Uh, and then even on checkout, you can see the, the fee fines that are owed. So it's all over the place. So uh, paying and refunding and waiving and all that is all happening uh, within the fee fine history. So if you're looking at the fee fine history page, you have all these options available to you we're trying to make it easy. So if a patron comes in and wants to pay several fee fines or if you wanna waive several fee fines or whatever, you actually can click on the, in the little boxes here and process several at the same time. So you would click on the little box and then click waive and you could process uh, several of them, <laughs> sorry. And you can also process one at a time by clicking on uh, the uh, one of the action items here with the ellipsis. Uh, we also have something that uh, Chicago requested, but I think everybody thinks it's pretty cool, called quick pay down. So a lot of times a patron will come in and say, help, I can't check out books. Uh, I need to uh, have my balance under $100. Uh, I owe too many fee fines and I owe, you know, I owe $180 but I have to have it under $100. And so what they really wanna do is just pay $80 off so that they get to $100. And so they don't care what they're paying off, it's just like, here's $80. And so what they do is, yeah, it's like, please let me check out books. So what they do, what they'll do is what's called a quick pay down. And so the, the uh, staff member will just click on quick pay down put $80 in and the system will, will pay off fees and fines for $80 because, okay. I think I'm, I'm pretty much done. I just, I'll just go real quick through these since you left me with three minutes. Um, so then uh, on the detail screen, you can also do some of the same functions. Uh, so uh, the next few screens, they all look the same really as far as paying, uh, waiving, and all of these waive reasons pay methods, all of that is, is set in a uh, in table, so it's all customizable. Um, we do have transfers to uh, Bursar, payroll, um, let's see here. We have refunds and we have an option where an institution can say, if you're issuing a refund, before you give a patron a refund, make sure that you pay other fees and fines that they owe, uh, you know, before you give them a refund. Uh, you can also cancel a fee fine if it was entered in error. And I'm not going to cover lost item processing. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you.
So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Todd Olson, and uh, Sharon Beltane and I will be presenting on on uh, the, the centrality of reporting for all SIGs and domains. So, I mean, really, what's so important about reporting, right? <laughs> well, everything, as it turns yes. out. <laughs> So we have, by, at the sort of the highest level, we have these kind of administrative and strategic reasons for reporting. We report out to um, all of these professional and effectively accreditation sorts of agencies. Um, we report up to our funding, whoever gives us our funding, whether we're uh, reporting up to the university provost or to a government uh, agency. Um, we use these for business intelligence, for strategic decisions. Um, so all that high level stuff is extraordinarily important. It, it really uh, gives us direction. Um, at a kind of mid tier level, we have a sort of operational management um, kinds of reporting where we're dealing with our daily operations, uh, making, you know, making uh, regular decisions and informing our daily practices. There's also this diagnostic level of reporting and that's um, how do we deal with different sorts of trouble? <laughs> um, you know, we get, uh, you know, we have uh, things go wrong in data uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, troubles, troubleshooting system problems, all sorts of things. And that's kind of down in the weeds. And this, these things affect all modules and really the most sophisticated use of them most sophisticated uses of these kinds of reports span the modules and they tie together all this information. And I think we have a wonderful quote from Christy Thomas that sums up that sort of operational and diagnostic uh, level. I'll just read it because operational experience over multiple ILS generations shows that we need to analyze our data in unpredictable ways, whether to support support policy changes or clean up erroneous data. Erroneous data can get into our system in a variety of ways. Vendors can give us incorrect data, operators can make errors with manual or batch processes, and software can create errors. We need to be able to analyze the data to validate existing data and determine scope of identified problems or needed changes. We often cannot predict in advance what sorts of data maintenance we will need to do. So this is like real on the ground weekly stuff. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to mention to Bridge from Fines and Fees that we're working on a special uh, export to go directly to the North Pole for Santa's naughty and nice list. <laughs> just to bridge the two presentations there. Holly didn't have time to talk about that report. Uh, In-app versus data warehouse. So um, we have divided reporting for the folio project into two basic areas. What we're calling in-app reporting is the reporting functionality that will come out of the different applications, resource access, resource management, et cetera, and um, provide your quick uh, data for day-to-day -day operations. Data warehouse reporting is the type of reporting where all of the data is streamed into a, a data lake and um, it's been transformed uh, into a data warehouse or several data warehouses. And typically, uh, we put a data structure of SQL um, in a data warehouse environment that can be used by data analysts, like those of us on the reporting SIG and many of you out there who are just trying to free the data um, with reporting applications. So um, typical reporting applications are Tableau, BERT, uh, and then we can generate the reports that we need. 
<clears throat> so uh, we've talked a lot about in-app reporting versus reporting through an external data store like a data lake or a data warehouse. Um, the benefit, of course, of in-app reporting is that it doesn't require a separate reporting application. It's quick, there's a short learning curve, and no data transformation is typically needed for that. The limitation is that day one for us, it's not going to provide the reporting functionality that is needed. Uh, we have more than 144 reports right now that we've collected requirements for from the various institutions involved in the project. Uh, so we know that we have a lot of complex reporting that goes across different applications and different systems that we need to do. With in-app reporting, you're limited to data within one functional area, like resource access, CERC reports, or um, acquisitions reports just for that area. It doesn't support cross-system or cross-app reports. For data warehouse reporting, the benefit um, is that we get all the data. We free the data and uh, that is needed for um, by the implementation. Uh, we can relate data across multiple functional areas. We can uh, tie what we purchase with how much it's circulated. And uh, in our reports, uh, diagnostic reporting can help ensure data integrity. So it's going to be important for the institutions who are participating in this project uh, to be able to use reporting to find problems in the data. We do that every day. Diagnostic reporting is a big area for us. Uh, the limitation is that it requires using a separate reporting application. You have to be somewhat of a data analysis nerd uh, to go into this world, right, and love data, um, which is great. Um, it, it requires somewhat of a steep learning curve for the average uh, user and uh, requires um, data transformation, a separate data store environment. What is a data lake? Everybody asks that. It's this thing where you just plop data in there. Um, <laughs> so we've had a lot of discussions about what those of us in the reporting field understand as a data warehouse versus a data lake environment. Basically, what we're talking about is a data lake is a, an unstructured raw data type of environment where you're just you know, moving the data from Folio into the data lake to get it there quickly. The data warehouse environment is going to be where we have structured data. And so it is very uh, uh, um, feasible to set up data warehouses uh, within a data lake environment and perhaps potentially multiple data warehouses. Um, so we're looking at a data lake um, environment because it's the, the new way to go with data and it provides us with the flexibility uh, to have multiple data sets. Cross domain reporting. Um, this is one of the largest areas for the data analysts who work in libraries every day. Uh, we have to tie together reports on users, inventory, and loans. So one of the things that uh, we need to do with our data lake environment is to be able to tie that data together into reports for daily operations. Um, so you can see that um, the process of reporting is going to require bringing these different uh, types of data together, normalizing, synthesizing into um, all kinds of different reports. <clears throat> <laughs> Putting a data lake together is not easy. There's the timer, sorry. Okay, all right, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. <laughs> oh, that's two minutes, okay, okay, well, uh, still, okay. Um, all right, so this is a simplified view of our data lake environment. So we're talking about, we have the Folio uh, LMS, and there's what we're finally calling the data river, which is all the logic that will need to be uh, put together and um, development to support the data lake environment. Um, for the, uh, once we get to the data lake, you use your reporting application, generate reports. Okay. So, um, so to establish data confidence, what do we mean by establishing confidence in our data? Um, we're talking about a couple of things. One of them is referential data integrity. You know, anyone working with uh, RDBMSs will know what I'm talking about. You have uh, relationships between entities, you know, like bits and holdings and items, where you want to make sure there are no dangling references. Every time uh, a loan references a patron and an item, you want to know that there is really a patron and an item at the other end. This is the kind of thing we're talking about. And we don't want those to rot on the vine. 
uh, which they can do through um, software errors and other sorts of things. Um, and that's really how we have confidence, confidence that, one way that we have confidence that our data is correct. Um, there are other, and this is a challenge because, you know, we're, we've moved into a kind of siloed data universe. And so now the uh, kind of referential uh, transactional guarantees that a traditional RDBMS environment gives us, um, we need other ways of meeting those, of, of ensuring that we have that kind of referential integrity. Um, and there are other areas for data confidence, you know, making sure that pro uh, policies and practices are adhered to. And these things change over time. We get bad data from air, from vendors. We need to find and correct these things. So there's a structural level of data confidence and then there's kind of a content level of data confidence. Um, so I just expand through this. Here we go, ready? Okay. We're in the reporting stage. We work hard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just to recap, you know, uh, this, this reporting stuff is very, is critical. It drives all sorts of decisions from high level to low level. Um, and really the take home is that libraries depend upon these, upon these accurate analytics. Um, in order to implement, we need fully functional cross domain reporting. Uh, no one will implement without that. And so we really need this day one. Um, there's a number of things that will be required to make that a reality. Uh, immediately, we're looking to set up a reporting test environment that's as functional as we can make it um, to identify data elements that we would need for, that anyone would need in building a data warehouse on top of the data lake. And then also um, identifying in app reports with functional areas. And in these, all of these areas, we're working with uh, metadata management SIG and data migration groups, and then we'll be reaching out to other SIGs as we can. Um, and then I'll just leave you again with that uh, quote from Christy. Yes, and, I, and I want to say thanks um, uh, to Ingolf, uh, Ingolf Kuss, and who uh, has helped with this presentation, Anne Highsmith, Michael Winkler, Scott Perry, Simone Tabakuru, uh, Christy Thomas and Holly Missabov. We really appreciate your contributions. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. I am Anne Marie Bro, and I came from the YDP side of the house uh, of EBSCO. My background is acquisitions librarian, kind of secondarily cataloging librarian. And TAGS is one of the fun, smaller pieces of folio. It grew out of the work that we have been doing in acquisitions uh, to try to figure out how we wanna um, structure order records and information about orders and all the kinds of things you have to report on. I'm not sure anybody has more reports than acquisitions, um, although I might be challenged on that. But in pretty much every system in the order records, you'll see versions of codes that are used to classify types of orders. Um, why did we order this? Um, and why do we want to report on this? And so those tended to be hard, field, hard coded fields. And we thought, uh, why not try something a little bit newer, like the idea of tags that were less structured, and then try that across folio so that we could have a little thing to play with, a little playground. So that's the background for tags. We put together a little subgroup, and you'll see we're across different functionality. Um, and we have met pretty quickly. It's, it took us just two or three months and we're now as of Friday on hiatus until there's screen, uh, screens in my folio to look at. 
So what are tags for the developers in the room that are used to JIRA? It's what you call labels. Um, if you're used to social media, it's things that you want to stick on something. Um, and typically we're, we're thinking of them in two ways for folio. One is I want to be able to gather up a bunch of stuff that have a same characteristic so that I can then do something with those, export them, batch edit them, um, uh, suppress them from my, my uh, uh, discovery, whatever it is that you may want to do. And I want to be able to filter and report using those tags. Tag, another word for it is label, if you're more used to that in, in other systems. It is not intended to be notes. It is not to, intended to be as free text as notes. The intent is if you're tagging, it's probably because you want to use that same tag on multiple records to be able to gather up those records. And it's definitely not custom fields. Um, the, the intent with tags is I have a, a word or a set of words, but I don't have an entity, uh, a taxonomy associated with that, that I need to keep organized and separate from other taxonomies. So custom fields is more likely what you need if you, if you uh, are wanting that. What we're envisioning is that this is a centrally administered app. Once you have tags and the systems librarian turns it on, then any main app in Folio that can work with tags on its records will have tags enabled. And if the systems librarian doesn't turn it on, then you don't have tags anywhere in Folio. We're calling this a helper app, and I think there was a session yesterday on helper apps. So basically not an app that you're um, uh, starting with most of the time. It's, it's going to uh, be evidenced on records that are in other types of apps the various acquisitions apps or user app. And to that end, if you've seen the little notes icon in some of the live folio, it's very analogous to that. So we decided to break the work into two phases. Um, thanks to Kate for helping us get this sorted. First is how do I work with tags on individual records in individual apps? And then secondarily, how do I have a way to have some central administration and understanding of tags across all of Folio? So for individual records, how can I see tags? What do they look like on the records? Um, how do I add tags, get rid of tags on the records? And then once I've got tags on records, how can I use those to filter within that particular app and the permissions that are needed to drive that? There's no UI component really to be able to access a central um, administration or tag list in phase one. Um, there is work that's been done, but you don't get to see the central tag list where when you create a new tag, those are all being added to a central tag list behind the scenes, but you don't have access to that in phase one. So these are my um, 10th grade yearbook mock-up on paper in 1983 uh, abilities for wireframes. So <laughs> apologies, they're not beautiful in some cases. Um, so the tags will be up in the top right where you normally see the little edit pencil a lot of times or the little notes icon. If you have existing tags on a record, you'll see the number of tags that are associated with that record. And the tag, it's hard to see here, but it looks like a little sales tag uh, for the icon. When you click that, it opens a fourth pane that shows you the tags associated with the record. And when we talk about record, it's any type of record. So this is showing an instance record, but it could be a user record or an order record or an invoice, um, lots of different kinds of records in Folio. And you'll see the tags that are associated with this particular record in the top chunk in alphabetical order. There's a little X next to them so that you can take the tag off. And then the bottom, there's an enter a tag box. If I only have view permissions and I start to type something, it'll highlight that tag on the record, but I can't add or delete tags. If I have the permission to assign tags that already exist, when I start typing, it's going to suggest tags that are in that central tag list already, and I can pick those, one of those or multiple of those, to add to this particular record. 
but I can't create a new tag that's not already in that central tag list. And finally, if I have create permissions, then I start typing, it will auto suggest what's already in the tag list. But if I finish by typing something that doesn't already exist, it will add that tag to the central tag list and to my record. And then it's available as a existing tag for a next person to use. And then the last piece of phase one is once I've started adding tags, I'm gonna have a new filter over in the first pane that will be my tags filter. It will only show tags that are assigned to records in that particular app. So if in the users app, I have a VIP tag or a deceased tag, but it's not being used in the finances app, then I won't see that in my filters and finances. Although we've had conversations about VIP vendors as well. So phase two is great. We've now got uh, tags all over records, all over folio. Wild West, how do we start to manage it a little bit? Also comfort level for those who want to have some ability to do some central administration. So this will be when you see the tags app showing in that top app bar for the first time. And there'll be basically two screens in uh, the tags app. You'll be able to search for how a tag is used across all the records, across all the apps in Folio. And you'll be able to work with the tag record itself. So we'll have a little app up top. And when I click it, I'm going to come into a search screen. And I've already done a search in this case. I'll have the ability to search by the tag, because you may have hundreds of tags by this point, And I don't want to have to scroll all the way down so I can type the tag. I'll also have the ability to filter by the tag and filter by the record type. So if I just want to see all the tags that are being used in invoice lines records, I could do that. If I put in a tag and it's being used across multiple record types, my second pane is going to show, oops, there's my filter. My second pane is going to show me those search results. I have the little icon that tells me what type of record it is. And then the third pane is going to show me the details for that particular record type. I can't edit these details in the tags app, but there's an open an app button down here that will allow me to see that record in its main app. And then depending on what permissions I have as far as editing um, instance records or orders, I can do my editing there. And the fourth app, or sorry, the fourth pane will be the tags app. I can, in the central edit admin area, edit tags on any record in any app. I can't edit the main details, but I can edit the tags. Is that my 10 minutes? Okay. The central tag list, I just got a couple more screens. Central tag list is where I'm going to be able to see my list of all my existing tags. And I'll be able to create new tags that haven't yet been assigned. Oh, there it went. <laughs> haven't been assigned to any records yet. And when I do that, I get a blank tag record. It has all of two fields. What's the name of the tag and how am I using that tag? And then it's going to have a little summary down here that is basically another way to filter into my results. And on that individual tag app, I have things that I can do. I can edit the tag. I made a typo. I need to fix it in the central list and on the records. I can smush if I did new hyphen York and new underscore York to make sure that they're all consistent. And I can delete a tag from central and from all the records it's attached to. So where we are now, phase one, thank you, Heike, the back end work has been done to create the central tag list. Um, the UI work is kind of under analysis and is getting underway, John Coburn. Um, and we have gone through the phase one stuff with all the various SIGs. Not sure exactly when it'll be done, but hopefully we'll start seeing it pretty soon. This came out of acquisitions, but we're going to do proof of concept with the users app because that's kind of the most mature and stable in the central folio, live folio. And we want to check out the VIPs. So as soon as it's available, we'll start playing with it in, in our users. We have finalized the phase two stories and the wireframes. I got to get them written up for the developers. Uh, yeah, 14 May didn't quite happen, but soon. 
Oh, no, 14 weeks is going to happen. And, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was thinking April. Um, and then phase two, we're going to show it to the SIGs if they need to see it. Once we have our hands on it, then we need to play with it. And then we're going to be done. Um, there's other ideas that people have had. We're basically going to gather those up and stick them on a list and worry about them after the one. So that is that. PowerPoint. Do you want the slides? Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. My name is Darcy Brancini. I work at Cornell University and I'm working as a UX designer as well as a product owner on this project. Um, I first apologize. I think I'm the only one that didn't use the folio uh, slide deck. And it's not that I don't love it, because I actually love the new logo. Um, I guess I just kind of went with an old slide deck and tried to pull out what I needed for this presentation. Um, so we're going to talk about staff slips and patron notices. Um, unfortunately, this isn't really a demo. Um, it's more of a status update, because we don't have anything really working in production at this point in time. Um, I'm realizing. Does my voice go in and out when I talk this way? No? Okay. And maybe I can just sort of look at this screen too. But um, so with staff slips, we're a little further along. We've um, required, we've gathered requirements. Um, we have some early prototypes designed. We sort of teased out a common um, particular, like one particular staff slip that seems to be common across mo many institutions. Um, created user stories for that. Development has started. Um, whereas in patron notices, we're just in requirements gathering mode. And in fact, we had a really important meeting yesterday in the RA SIG um, on this topic. So staff slips. So first of all, um, you know, what are we even talking about? I think a lot of people call these print slips. Um, we decided to use the term staff slips since they are very particular for staff's um, workflow needs. Um, the work, the use cases that you might see covered under this area are things like um, call slips, routing, uh, if something needs to go in transit to home location or a requested location, workflow, not to be confused with the workflow engine. Um, these are workflow needs, um, things like repair, cataloging, um, as well as a hold slip. Um, what we didn't really consider in this particular area um, are receipts, um, notices, that might be printed as well, um, or reports. Although I have to say that becomes a very sort of um, blurred area because a lot of times people don't necessarily want to print a call slip, but they might want to print a call list um, and then just go pull all items that are in that list. Um, so what's important to this? Um, it needs to be customizable in layout, font, style, as well as what it says and what fields are shown. Um, it needs to be able to print automatically. Um, I think this is a, a, a bit of an um, obstacle. Um, but it needs to print automatically upon check-in um, or upon a patron request, um, depending on the type of slip. Um, so if we look at this scenario of a hold slip, which actually I think is um, something that, uh, that um, Tanya talked about, which is the requests and um, items that are recall. So patron A has an item checked out, patrons XYZ might be in a queue because they've recalled the item. Um, so patron A returns the item um, to the requested pickup location, which then would trigger a staff slip to be um, printed automatically, a hold slip in particular. Um, so the flip side of this is how do we configure this? How do we provide the right interface for people to set these up? Um, so this is in your settings and configuration area. Um, and you will see that we have a sort of a, a quick list here, but some of these would be um, out of the box and some of them would be um, custom uh, staff slips. And also we would provide the uh, ability to clone or duplicate one and then customize it. Um, 
right here is basically your, your basic template or layout. So what it required was basically having a rich text editor in there so that you could customize the way these print out. Um, and then what I'm showing as the drop down is basically your fields or tokens that you can insert into the, the staff slip. And then we have a preview button, so you'd be able to, oh, sorry, that's just an up close version of that. <laughs> um, then you have a preview where you could actually look at this to see if it's actually what you want it to look like before you go um, printing off a bunch of them. So I'm going to segue to patron notices next. Um, patron notices are very particular to um, the patron's needs. So these are notices um, to alert a patron of something that's happened. Um, Either something's become overdue, they have a fee, and fi fee fine that's been um, accrued, or um, in the courtesy notice might be something that is prior to something becoming overdue. Um, there's also receipts, which might be a check-in receipt, check-out receipt, a fee fine paid receipt. Um, we also talked a little bit about account changes. It might be nice to get an alert or a notice um, when, say, a proxy is changed or um, an address is changed on your account, just so, like a confirmation that that's actually what you wanted to happen. Um, claims returned, I'm not gonna get into that today. Um, and then ad hoc is an interesting concept because it was, um, instead of it being event driven, um, so that's kind of my next bullet point, this is more, I just wanna select a bunch of users and the use case that came up is I might wanna select all graduating seniors a month prior that, all, that have a fee fine balance of $50 or more and then send them a notice of some sort that they need to pay that. Um, so we basically came, so the important pieces of this um, to make this work is that they're event driven, there might be a set of conditions, there's a schedule that goes along with it, um, and sometimes we like to define this by interval, like if a fee fine is implemented every day after that fee fine um, is accruing, you might want to send them a reminder. Um, whereas you might want to send a courtesy notice three days out prior to being overdue. Um, and then templates are really important to this as well, um, wanting control over the layout and the style. And then the preference, and I think this is going to happen in the user record where it'll be uploaded by default what the institution wants it to be, email, text, um, and maybe print. I know some institutions don't do any print at all, and then some have a requirement that they have to for certain receipts, or um, certain um, notices. Um, and then, so here's some particular use cases, and then they're characterized. So here's kind of how I see a few of these. Um, overdue may eventually go into a returned, overdue lost. Um, so these are really progressive um, by their very nature recalled, available, expired, they may or may not go into those next phases, essentially, but they are progressive by their nature. Um, and then there's some that are just single instance, um, like a fee fine receipt, a checkout receipt, or a check-in receipt. Um, and then that last scenario that I already described, which was the ad hoc scenario. Um, so this is just that one particular, I'm not gonna go into every use case, but one particular use case and you can see how it progresses over time. Um, the sort of, because we, you know, in this case, I, I think of this as mainly event driven, but there's that earlier one, that first trigger, which is not truly a change in status, it's an impending um, change in status on the item. So we met yesterday in the RACIG to talk about um, how do we wanna handle these? And I gave them a few options as far as, you know, the logic, which is, in my mind, is considered the event, the trigger, the conditions, and the schedule, and then that template. What does it actually say? What does it look like? Um, and I presented one option. I crossed it off because it basically was, I got it. <laughs> um, it was an option where um, the template and the logic were together, and we decided not to go in that direction. And then options two and three are essentially the, the template and the logic, what's in common for both of those is that they're separate. Um, the option two, though, it's in the, the logic is defined in the loan policy in this particular use case. Um, and in option three, it would be defined using workflow. So I'm just going to show this really quick. Um, what's nice about this is that the loan policy, um, the, it's tightly coupled to the progression that happens in a loan policy. 
So you'd be picking your courtesy notice and then maybe your overdue notice one, overdue notice two, but it's two separate sections in settings. So you would actually write out your um, template here and then select them in your loan policy. Whereas option three, and I, these are just, you know, pulled out of Philip's presentation. So this is our workflow. Um, if we look at that bottom right corner of triggers and workflow steps, it would look something like this. Um, and you would have this send overdue notice um, number two. It actually is the opposite because otherwise you'd have to say over one day in less than three days. So I did it the opposite way. But anyway, um, you have your overdue notice two, which is the sort of more important or um, it's, it's overdue by a longer period of time. Overdue notice one was sent because it was um, past one day notice and or overdue. And um, that's the first one that's sent. Um, one of the things that came out in the SIG was that it was really important that the that they have this ability to define different notices at those different points in time because you might want to use sort of escalating language that it's really important that you that you turn in your item. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go over that because it looks like I'm starting to run out of time. Um, but again, the user would define kind of how they want to get, receive a notice. And then um, for each notice, you would actually set up your email, your text, and your print template um, because you might have a user that wants one or over the other. Um, so we need a way to basically um, template what that looks like, but also, oh, I guess I thought I had a, a picture of that one, but I don't. Um, so we're looking at templating languages essentially to do this um, because we do need a way to loop through a list of items um, display specific attributes about um, particular fields. Um, so next steps. Um, so what came out of our meeting yesterday was that people would really prefer to use workflow if it's ready. Um, but loan policy also is a good um, next step. So we're thinking that what's nice about the option two and tying it to the loan policy is that it does separate the template from um, from the logic. And so that sets us up nicely for then following up with integrating it using um, workflow if we wanted to do that. And I think um, that is about it. That's all I have. Good morning. So my name is Anya Arnold. I am the PO for Reserves, a subgroup of the RA SIG. So, but it's not just me alone. I have many members of the group, Andrea, Yarmo, Mike, Priera, and I always get her name wrong. So just so you know, it's probably wrong. Um, Rick, Tanya, and Wendy, and you can see their institutions. So we have a wide variety of people looking, working on this with different concepts of what reserve workflow actually looks like, which is good. And what we all hate about our current reserve workflow. If you are interested in anything about reserves, um, I do keep a running tally of our notes and there's a quick link and it'll go and all the videos are right there. Enjoy when you need to sleep. <laughs> okay. So what's interesting is that um, Folio already has some capabilities already there that would help with reserves. Um, we are currently able to change item locations to technical locations. That is really important, right? Um, we have the ability to change an item type to a temporary type, right? So that plays into the loan rule. Um, we have ability to actually create an item and put it in our inventory plus. Um, so when a professor says, here's, here's the book I want you to put on reserve, um, we can add that to um, our inventory. Um, and we can create loan rules that work. So good, right? This should be enough for reserves, right? No. 
<laughs> so, but it is enough for reserves for those people that have, say, Aries, right? So this basic functionality, um, as long as it's API and LTI compliant, would be fine. And that is what we've determined um, going through this process. Um, and here, here, here's our actual proof that we have those capabilities. So we were going through a show me type phase, like show us all of your workflows and what do we need to do? And it really was determined that people that had Aries, they're okay for the most part for now. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's all right. Um, but what we really needed was a way to keep track of our courses and assign um, items to those courses no matter how crude it was at the very beginning. We needed a way to do this. So I made sure that every one of those subgroup members said yes. So it's their fault as well, <laughs> right? So blame them. So we need a new course module. So this is not a demo, it's a, it's a demonstration of our ideas and thoughts. Um, we need a new model or module for, for Folio. And that's really the beauty of Folio is that we've recognized a need. Um, so we're going to base it off of requests and all the hard work that's already gone in there. Um, and so within our course module, um, of course, we need a course name, department, section number, and unique IDs. But what we all love about academic departments is that um, sometimes courses are cross-listed and sometimes they still have the same name but different department or different se sections so we need to make sure that we can list all the different names for all the different courses even though that course is only held at one time taught by one professor and is listed multiple times so, so is the course cross-listed needs to be very important and all of those fields course name department section um, need to be repeatable. Other things in a course record would be taught by, which is a generic word for instructor, but we all also have GTFs and we didn't want to get into the politics of what that word was. So taught by was okay. Um, academic year, term, date, custom dates. I have those all underneath because I think we've spent um, at least six hours talking about um, just year and time and date and how we're going to figure that out. So we, we still need to figure that out. Um, default service point locations um, and default loan policies. And this would also create probably new statuses such as waiting and then all these other waiting things. Fulfillment, processing, recall, supplied by professor, searching stacks, barcodes, scanning. See, I had to go to, on to another slide because there's too many. <laughs> Available at reference desk, missing or claim return, which some of these are reusable, but they're in different, a different area of folio. So a very over oversimplified workflow would be a reserve request is made. And so we're not even getting into how the reserve request is made. It's just somehow there. Um, we need to make a course and then associate items with that course. Then we need to pull those items, the physical copy. So we're actually leaving the system and pulling them. Um, process items for reserve and then moving it, the items to the shelving location of which that patrons will come and say hey I need this item okay that's for print oversimplified everybody agree if it was that beautiful we wouldn't have jobs um, so on the electronic side again oversimplified the request is made associated with the items with the course we download it we scan it we link it. Those are the different options that we do. We process the items for a reserve, um, and then we have to worry about copyright, right? So a nice to have for, yeah, I just skimmed over a whole bunch of other stuff. 
a nice to have with reserves, which is a nice to have for everything, um, is the ability to batch or batch edit. So we, we that's where we started. Um, but we determined that batch is more important than just reserve, and so. Um, or we created a JIRA ticket. It's right there. It's linked. So if you guys want to you know, have fun with it. Um, but it, it also lists out what we believe we would need. Okay. So we're just at the point where we're writing up these documentations. I've written a grand total of two use cases and have said, is this the right format that you want? Because I'm not going to write a whole bunch of them, right? And have to go back and, oh, it's horrible. Um, so we're going through this. I do have a very long document of what we believe is happening, which is on that link of notes that was at the beginning. Um, but we're really just slowly walking through this. This is a big undertaking. Um, so hopefully next time we get together, I'll be able to demo actually placing the items on reserve. In questions, I'm way under time, so I love it. If you've had the question, we've discussed it. We've had many things so far since since the end of January. <laughs> All right, we'll go on. Thank you. <laughs> we couple of updates I'm going to give to you, um, both on sort of infrastructural features. Um, the first ones I'm going to talk about are locations and service points, and then I'll talk about internationalization. So I think many of you know by now that we are implementing in Folio a semi-hierarchical uh, location structure. So we've got a fixed hierarchy of institution, campus, and library, and then um, locations can have a sort of flexible set of location details um, to give you more definition about where something actually resides. Um, these are name value, name value pairs. You can have as many of them as you want. You can call them whatever you want. So I've got department and section in here, but it can really be anything you want. So very flexible. Um, so that's the model. Uh, now I wanted to show you how we actually create these and this is hot off the presses. We do have, so I care. We do have the ability now to actually create these in Folio. So I am logged into Folio, I'm in the settings app, and if I go into organization, you'll see there's a new section here called location setup. And um, here you can add institutions, campuses, libraries, and locations. So I'll start with institutions because it's the top of the hierarchy. Um, you can see I already added one institution here, um, Duke. Um, you can have more than one institution in a, in a tenant. Um, we're using our standard controlled vocabulary component here. Um, so this is very much like many other um, pages you'll see in settings. 
Um, you can add things quite easily. Um, just click new and you can type in the name um, and a code and save, cancel. <clears throat> Um, it automatically records, you know, when it was last updated, when it was created, which user did it. There's a link over to the user record. Um, it also shows you if this institution has actually been used in any locations that have been created. Um, so we're using the same component for creating campuses as well. So um, to create campuses, you first have to indicate what institution you want to add the campuses to. Um, and then you just create the campuses in the same way. Libraries work very similarly. Um, here you have to select the institution and then the campus, and then you can start adding the libraries. All right, so that's kind of the, the structured hierarchy. Now we want to create some very specific locations using that structure. Um, so I've added a number of them here. Let's take a look at, at one. Let's just edit one. As you can see, we've got a little bit of some real estate and layout issues here, but we'll fix that. Um, so this is a location record. Basically, a location is you know, a very specific place where something can live within a library. Um, and so when you're creating a location record, you do need to say, all right, well, what institution um, is this location in? What campus is it in? What library is it in? So this, these are all populated with the values that I created in the other screens. Um, you then give the location a, um, a name and then a code. Um, so the idea with the code is um, it's if you create a meaningful code um, for your locations, um, it'll be easy when you're assigning locations to items or holdings in inventory um, to get there. So, you know, this one is a pretty logical one. I've dropped the, the Duke, the D-U-K, because this is a single uh, institution tenant. It doesn't seem like you would need to put that in every location code. But I created a code that, you know, was like main campus, PR for Perkins, and then something, you know, meaningful to represent that this is the East Asian collection maps. Um, and we did allow you to capture codes when you were creating your institutions, campuses, and libraries, just so that they're here for reference um, and to help ensure that you're um, using the consistent codes when creating these longer location codes. It also sets us up um, to possibly auto-generate codes later on if we decide we want to do that. Um, you can put in a discovery display name for the location. It has a status, um, active or inactive. Um, you might make a location inactive if it's being deprecated and you don't really want to assign that location to any um, items going forward, um, but it's still a place where things reside. Um, you can give it a description. And then down here at the bottom is, are those details, the location details. So as I said, they're name value pairs. I just put in you know, area, East Asian collection, section, maps. You can add you know, if you wanted to have uh, yet another sort of location detail or property associated with this, you could add it here. So those are kind of the details um, about where you can, where, where these things are. Um, okay. uh, so that is actually creating locations. Let me just go back to my, nope. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about assigning locations. <clears throat> so um, Folio is going to support both permanent and temporary locations. Anya already talked about that. We already do have a basic implementation of this, but we're restructuring things a bit um, in the inventory app. So we're gonna have both permanent and temporary locations um, at the holding and the item level. So the locations that have been assigned at the holding will be automatically inherited by any items in that holding record, but you can overwrite um, both permanent and temporary location within the item record if needed. Um, and then when those item level overrides are removed, then the inheritance from the holding will resume. So that's uh, the general structure. And then I can also show you live what the assignment UI looks like. So let's go into inventory. Pick something with an item. 
<clears throat> so here's an item record and we'll go to the temporary location. Um, and you can see that I have two different ways to um, assign a location to an item record or a holding record. It's, it, the UI will be the same whether you're assigning at the item level or the holding level, whether it's permanent or temporary. Um, if you know the code for the location that you want to assign, you can just start typing in here. So M-A-I-P-E-R and you know, it will auto-complete and get you the, um, the location. Um, it will also autocomplete on the name, which is also displaying here. Yeah. So, so if you if you have a known location, it's a very easy to sort of find the one you want. Um, if you don't actually know the code or the name of the location you want to assign, we have a location lookup pop up um, that you can open and um, sort of browse down. So you don't really know it's somewhere in the main campus in the Perkins Library, um, and then this really kind of helps you narrow down. Now down to find the, the right location. All right. Um, okay, now to service points. <clears throat> um, so service points, so locations are, are where things live. Um, service points are actually operational locations, like CERC desks, um, ILL offices, or binaries. They're where things happen. Um, they can be and associated with locations. So one of the main use cases is, um, you know, you you check an item in at a service point at a CERC desk. You need to look at that service point to see what locations it's been associated with, and you look at the item to know <laughs> what its location is, and, and that helps the system determine whether the location is home and just needs to be reshelved or if it needs to go in transit to its home location. So that's kind of the connection between service points and locations. Um, we are going to implement a many-to-many -many relationship between service points and locations. Um, so one service point can cover many locations, of course, but one location can actually be covered by many service points. So you might have you know, one shelf in the library that is home or has you know, a couple of different CERC desks that really represent home for it. Um, service points don't have loan rules directly applied to them. Um, loan rules are associated with locations. And then this is also brand new. Uh, we have the ability to create service points, although we don't yet have the ability to assign locations. Okay. That's 10 minutes or is it? Okay. All right, really quick. Um, So here's a um, super simple um, service point. Um, it's a CERC desk. You give it a code. Um, it also can have a discovery display name, a description. There's a lot of properties actually that are going to end up on the service desk. We're just starting with some basic ones that we can actually make use of in Folio, such as shelving lag time. Um, this will help us determine you know, when something is checked in at its home location, how long is it you know, recently returned before it goes into available status. Um, you know, is the service point a pickup location? Um, and then we'll be able to assign multiple locations um, to this service point. We haven't added that yet. All right. So uh, next up. Yeah, so in addition to adding the ability to associate locations with service points, we also need to figure out um, how a service point is going to be selected um, as sort of the, the place of operation within Folio. Um, so initial discussions suggest that um, users will be able to be associated with service points and that they'll have sort of a default service point. Um, and then when they log in, they'll kind of be logged into this service point by default, but you can change them to other service points. Um, so we still need to kind of uh, finalize the designs, but this is sort of the direction we're, we're heading in. There's still some work to be done on service points for sure. All right, so I'm out of time for service points and now I'm going to transition to the last presentation of the day, internationalization and localization. This one I'm not gonna show live. I'm just gonna show some slides here. 
So just a bit of history to start out with. Um, we do have a Folio International SIG. Um, it's comprised of an international group of SMEs and designers and developers. Um, we met um, several times in early 2017, actually, and the group has been on hiatus ever since. Um, but in those early meetings, we did identify what were the top priorities for internationalization and localization for Folio and V1 in the V1 roadmap spreadsheet. And so thinking about those features, I wanted to just give an update on um, what we have done, what's in progress, and what's still to do. Um, so we do have a tenant level locale setting. So if you go into settings organization, there is a language and localization area where you can select a um, locale. And a locale is a combination of a language and a region. Um, and by having a combination of those two, um, it sets Folio up to have different types of customizations, different types of translations and, and number and date formats um, based on different regions. So things are different in, in the UK than they are in the United States. And I'll show some of that um, here. So these are the kinds of things that that locale selection uh, determine in Folio today. So this is a screenshot of the check-in screen. And um, you can see that, you know, in the English Great Britain locale, the um, process as date and time are a different format than the, you know, the uh, US locale. Similarly, we've got locale-driven calendar format. We've got date pickers throughout Folio. And in the United States, the calendar starts with Sunday, whereas in Germany, it starts with Monday. Um, and then, of course, very importantly, the locale drives the display language. If you play around with locale and folio, you will see that we don't have many translations yet. Um, the UI strings have, though, for the most part, been extracted, so they should be translatable. So the UI has been internationalized. It's just we've got to collect these um, these translations. But thanks to Julian and, and his colleagues at GBB, we do have the users app translated into German, which is what you're seeing here. Um, Unicode support is obviously extremely important um, for Folio. It's just about encoding the text in the system so that it supports um, the writing systems of the world. We, you know, as you can see, we're properly displaying the characters here. <clears throat> right to left layout and text direction. So this is um, a screenshot of Folio where the CSS has been manually um, modified to display right to left. Um, so we know that it's supported, although I'm told from John Coburn that, that you know, the, the system has been coded in such a way that um, when we have some right to left uh, locales and translations in the system, the, the need to display right to left will automatically be detected and the system will display appropriately. So we need to do some testing with real data, but, but that's the way it's designed. Um, we have also recently implemented a tenant um, level time zone setting. This is really important for making sure that we have consistency around due dates and calculating of fees and fines. So that's what we have done. Um, one of the things we have in progress right now that's really exciting, um, the Kulto guys in Hungary have um, done an analysis of translation management tools um, out there today. These are you know, third party tools. It's not part of Folio, but they can be integrated with Folio and they provide a user interface for actually translating the application. Um, so um, we've selected one called Localize and this is a screenshot of Localize. Um, and basically what it does is it allows people to come in and you know, look at the, the English translation and then provide translations for other languages. Um, it's, it supports crowdsourcing, so this is something we can open up to the community um, and, and get translations that way. It does other cool things like it has machine translation, you can use Google Translate to get translations, um, duplication finder, proofreading, and other things. So this is very cool. Um, future features, these are some things that are planned for V1 that um, are still in the backlog but, but need to get done. So. The ability to translate backend values, um, such as menu values, status values, and things like that. Um, right now, it's just the UI strings that are um, translatable. Uh, similarly, for error messages that are coming directly from the backend. Um, we don't yet have locale-driven number format. It's not a huge technical challenge, and we wouldn't be coding something from scratch, but it's something that's still just to be done, to be configured. Um, transaction and analysis currencies for acquisitions and fees and fines. Um, this 
this the ability to you know record when you have a financial transaction what's the currency that that was used for the transaction and then um, the ability to define a default or um, analysis currency for your organization so you can do reporting and analysis across so these were some of the things that we had initially defined as post v1 um, so multiple supported languages per tenant so we know this is very very important to some institutions the ability to say um, have you know both English and Arabic for your institution um, and then the user can select which language they want to view the interface in um, it's just for simplicity for v1 we said we just have one um, again it's I don't think it's a huge technical challenge to move towards more than one but it's just something that we said we would do later um, once you have more than one supported language per tenant um, you uh, will need the ability to translate your tenant defined controlled vocabulary so if you say created for your tenant a number of material types um, in in arabic you want to then be able to provide the english translation to be displayed when users support the, select english um, support for currencies without decimals numerals aside from arabic numerals um, these things are considered out of scope this one sorting searching and collation um, this one was also said to be out of scope for V1. I've heard from Theodore this might actually be an issue um, with for Chalmers. So this might be one that we look at you know, in the context of you know, what are the early implementing institutions and determine whether there might be something more we need to do in V1 than we're already doing. And that's it. Right, that's great. And we are right on time. So we've done a remarkable job, if I do say so myself, of keeping on time. So thank you to all the presenters and for everyone to really keep it going, keep it, keep it moving along. Um, just a couple of last minute things to let you know. Uh, lunch on the schedule was listed as 12 to 1, but we have pushed that to 12.30 to 1.30 to accommodate the meetings, particularly the resource management meeting that is being held right here. Um, so just so you know, but we do have lunch uh, paid for, so please join us if, if you can for lunch. Um, all the presentations and the videos will all be posted online. So under the Folio Google Drive, we'll make sure to have everything there and we'll make sure to get that information out to you. Um, in addition, there are a number of recordings from the sessions. I think there are hours and hours and hours of recordings. Not all of them uh, are probably recorded properly, but whatever it is recorded, we will synthesize and get those posted as well. So anybody that may have missed something or wants to review something, if you had a conflict, you should be able to do that. Uh, interestingly, if you go on to YouTube and you search for WolfCon 2018, you will find a lot of the uh, uh, plenaries and other talks already posted up there. So you can, uh, you can check that out as well. Um, as far as events, this, uh, this was a huge success uh, from everyone that I've spoken to and we intend to do this annually. Um, there is in all likelihood going to be smaller groups, uh, technical meetings before uh, another annual event. We will keep you posted on those, uh, uh, those plans. Right now, we're still in the, in the process of thinking through what would make sense but you can count on this being an annual event and I suspect next time we get together, it's going to be even bigger than, than what we have today, which is just remarkable. And then lastly, I just wanna take a moment to thank everyone who helped plan this event, uh, who helped prepare and present all of you for all the work that you've done in the SIGs, uh, either in strategy or in planning or the developers and getting us to this point. It's, uh, it's a remarkable project. It's a remarkable progress that we've made and I know that everybody that I've spoken to has been duly impressed with how fast we're going and how we've come together as a community and it's really exciting. And on behalf of all the sponsors, which are the founding stakeholders, Archivum, Bywater and Duke University, I just want to say thank you again for taking the time out to come here. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all of your feedback and we hope to see you again. Thank you so much.
Thank you. 